Let's talk about governance and policy making this time. Um, governance and policy making in the Federal Republic of Germany. So, so, um, so most of my discussion will be confined to the, the western part of Germany. Okay. Um, when the Federal Republic was, was, in, was, was, was formed, 1949, um, the goal of the Republic was to work towards reunification. Okay. Um, and, um, and, and when a unified Germany was blocked, the idea of a unified Germany was blocked, um, everything was feeling a little bit of transitional. So, so the goal, the ultimate goal of reunification was there. And let's wait until um, the reunification to use a constitution. So a halfway house between a constitution and nothing was a compromise called an institution called Grundgesetz, which means basic law. Okay. So instead of a constitution, uh, the Germans adopted what's called the, the basic law. So, um, but later on it got regime-like, it got institutionalized, it, it's, it's the constitution, it's the functional equivalent of a constitution. Um, in a way, it is a constitution. It is the constitution of the Federal Republic. And um, even after reunification, the tradition continued. Um, it was supposed to be transitional, but still with the annexation of the Five Lander to, uh, to Western Germ like um, Federal Republic of Germany, uh, they kept using the term Grundgesetz, a basic law as the constitution of the uh, federal, rep the, the enlarged, reunified Federal Republic of Germany. Um, and the second uh, goal is, or has been, as it is ingrained in the constitution, um, ensure work to ensure lasting democratic order. Okay, so um, the memories of the experiences of World War II was fresh. Um, so, so we have to work toward uh, ensuring lasting um, democratic order. So the idea of never again. Okay, never again, right? Uh, we don't want to go back to those days. Um, we have to avoid the failure, what led us to, or within the Weimar Republic, what led us to Hitler. Um, okay, um, and, and um, so, so the weaknesses of the Weimar Republic uh, let's learn our lessons. Let's lesson draw or draw some lessons. Um, why did we have this? Because we had this, we had Hitler rising, uh, because we had emergency powers allowing centralization of authority. So, so the, the fact that the Weimar Republic institutionalized emergency powers uh, so the chancellor um, could um, could um, declare emergency powers, uh, suspending democratic rights, civil liberties. This led us to um, catastrophe. And um, secondly, political parties, the political system was highly fragmented. And with a fragmented political system, we had ultimate instability. Okay, fragmentation, many parties not being able to agree on top of this instability or produced instability. And uh, this, uh, this led to the government seizing emergency powers. So, um, Breaking legislative deadlock. Legislative deadlocks were frequent. Um, 1930s, 19, late 1920s, 
well, all 1920s, all throughout 1920s, early 1930s. So breaking legislative deadlock is very important. So we have to keep our system stable. So we have to have such a system that it's less fragmented, that it is solid, that is based on cooperation, collaboration, no more stalemates, no more gridlocks, um, and that there wouldn't be overly strong executive, and that there wouldn't be the option of emergency powers. Okay, so extraordinary circumstances brought catastrophe, so, so we have to be very careful with respect to how we form our new governing template, i.e. the Grundgesetz, the, the basic law. So the solutions were that let's have a system, a demo democratic system based on rule of law, um, a federal system in which we have, in a way, checks and balances. Okay, so, so there is no one centralized power. Power is diffused to the lender, the 11 lender uh, of the time, um, plus the five now 16. Uh, and that let's have a social state, okay, uh, and, and, um, and that there would be, as I said, rule of law accompanying um, a democratic political system. Uh, how do we do this? Let's have federalism, but not only federalism, but also a weaker presidency, weaker executive, so that there would be no possibility of arbitrary power. Um, so, so, so weaker presidency, federalism as in a way providing checks and balances to or into the system so that there wouldn't be um, possibilities of uh, resorting to arbitrary power. And second, and second institution is um, constructive vote of no confidence. This is an, an important element of the system of Grundgesetz, of basic law. I'll explain this further, but, but perhaps it may be a good time to talk about this. Uh, we haven't talked about the German political system, but what it means is that we've seen some systems, we've seen three political systems up until now, um, in case of a vote of no confidence, in case a government is threatened, the chancellor is to be dismissed or removed from office, the Grundgesetz ensures or m wishes to ensure that a new government is in place and it would replace the outgoing government almost immediately, almost simultaneously. Okay? So if a government is to be removed, there has to be change of guards in the sense that the next government has to be ready to be approved. So the dismissal an approval, it's within 48 hours. And dismissal is the process of dismissal or removal is not completed unless the new government comes to power. Okay? So um, in rare cases of, of, uh, of this, there has to be a constructive vote of no confidence, Gesundheit, so no confidence, a vote on no confidence, but it has to be constructive in the sense that it allows the next government to basically start governing. Okay, so um, the Bundestag, the legislature, may vote on this, but it's a consecutive dual vote in effect because a removal or a dismissal happens only with, only when it accompanies a coming into office, a successor comes into office. Okay, why, why do we talk about all this? Why did the Germans have uh, designed, devised this system? Because of um, 
instability, fragmentation, and also or fears of fragmentation, fears of instability, and also um, fears of uh, executives' arbitrary control. As you can see, it's a system. It's a it's a it's a it's supposed to be a system, a stable system, defragmented or um, unfragmented system. What are the basic principles of the Grundgesetz? Um, one basic principle is federalism, which in a way inhibits, which is supposed to inhibit um, centralized power um, at, the, at the national level. Um, but when you look at it this way, this is not a departure or a rupture from the past. Remember, it's in a way, a return to pre-1870s. Remember the, the map um, of German lands, Holy Roman Empire and German Empire? Remember we talked, I showed you that there are principalities, kingdoms, city-states. So the idea of federalism had been there. Subsidiarity had been there. Okay, All these principles, decentralized ways of um, governing, um, had been there before 1870s, before unification of Germany under Bismarck. So this is no alien. So the idea of federal ways of doing things, organizing your political system, is no alien to German lands. And uh, methods to prevent party fragmentation. One is that there is a national threshold of 5%. This is 5% of the vote for seats in the Bundestag, OK? So there's a national threshold at the federal level. Um, intervals for elections are set for four years, almost written on stone. Um, so there's no snap elections. There, there, there won't be snap elections. Um, the, the chancellor or even the president cannot call for a snap elections. So we know that um, the last elections, the next elections in, uh, is upcoming in 2017, minus 4, 2013, minus 4, 2009, minus 4, 2005. So, so we, the intervals are set, uh, like written in stone, like, like seriously uh, determined. And, and we've been having elections like that. Um, in the, in the post-World War II era. Um, constructive vote of no confidence, once again, unless a successor is guaranteed to have a vote of, con uh, I'm sorry, a vote of confidence, there won't be a vote of no confidence to the outgoing um, government or cabinet, okay? So um, outgoing has to be accompanied by an incoming. So successor has to be there in place. We all see and we all vote for it for us to be able to send the outgoing government. This was the case in 1982. Um, excuse me, when CDU leader Helmut Kohl uh, formed the coalition, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, formed the government um, after the outgoing coalition of SPD and CDU, which we shall be talking about later. Uh, the chancellor has increased powers, uh, so over time this has been strengthening vis-a-vis -vis the president. Um, there has be also been strengthening of the executive, even in Germany, which is um, so wary of, um, of increased um, or, in, or, or um, of the possibility of having arbitrary power. And presidents do not have emergency powers. So um, this, is, uh, this is against the Third Reich contra, in a way, in contrast to the Weimar Republic. Yes? Um, does any member constitution have emergency powers, or just the... No, no, no emergency powers in the sense that we have in, for example, France. We don't have the same um, 
institutional apparatus um, in Germany as we have, have elsewhere. Um, what does the German government system look like? Um, it's a federal system with 16 lender. Um, each 16 of these, each of these 16 lender have parliaments. I got this from your textbook, by the way. Um, so they all have their own parliaments. They all have their governments. Um, and we have a system of parliamentary democracy. So we don't have a uh, parliamentary system, although we have, I'm sorry, a presidential system, although we have a president, um, it's the passive wing of the executive. So we have um, the federal chancellor, the, equ the functional equivalent of what we have in Britain or in, um, in France as the premier, the, the prime minister, federal chancellor who forms his or her cabinet. We have the Bundestag directly elected with the public or through the public. The public directly elects Bundestag and the, the public directly elects in the 16 Länder, the parliaments. We have the Bundesrat, which represent uh, uh, members sent by the 16 Länder governments. And when the Bundesrat, um, I'm sorry, when the, um, when the 16 Länder governments, um, yes, elect or send members of the Bundesrat. And we have um, the Bundestag and the, the land governments, their representatives, they form the federal convention, which elect the federal president. Okay, so it's the Bundesrat, members of the Bundesrat, and the 16 land governments. So the lower house in the parliament, the federal parliament, and the federal, I'm sorry, uh, land lander parliaments, they elect, they form the federal convention and elect the federal president. Okay, so it's, it's a system of parliamentary democracy, um, which means effectively the executive dominating the legislature, because we've talked about this before, uh, executive dominating, de facto dominating the legislature. This is the case because we have the, the Bundestag, the parliament, out of which we have the cabinet. Okay, and the cabinet has to enjoy confidence in the parliament as long as the, the executive, the cabinet, enjoys confidence of the parliament, it stays in power. As long as it does so, it will be able to dominate the parliamentary agenda. Is that clear? So de facto, it will be dominating, I mean, the executive will be dominating the legislature. Um, and in this case, there is some kind of a def um, um, some kind of a, uh, a, a fusion of powers as opposed to the principle of separation of powers because you have the executive dominating the legislature. That means that these two powers are in a way fused. Is this clear? Okay. Or you had a question? Okay, that's a good question because I didn't explain it well. Uh, I, I will explain this further later on. But uh, Bundestag is the lower house of the German parliament. Bundesrat is the upper house of the parliament. Okay, so, so it's a bicameral two-chamber parliament. The Bundestag is, whenever we refer to the parliament, we refer to the Bundestag. Um, and the Bundesrat is the is the upper chamber in the parliament, uh, which is, um, I mean, elect, elect mem members, uh, their members are elected in, di in two different ways, which we shall talk about a bit later. Um, the executive, um, when we look at the system, there's a division between 
the chancellor, which is the head of government, and the president, which is the head of, or who is the head of the state, there is a very clear distinction between rights and responsibilities among these, these two um, executives. Um, the president has a weaker ceremonial and therefore not political role. He is the head of the state. He is elected um, for five years um, by the federal convention. Okay, so he's, he's chosen by the federal convention and uh, in general is supposed to provide continuity in case of crises. So as you can see, the system is the system insert, inserted the presidency as a caretaker. So um, continuity in times of crisis. Um, and the federal convention, the Bundestag, members of the Bundestag, uh, 630 members of the Bundestag, plus an equal number of delegates from state legislatures, land parliaments. Okay, another 630 something um, delegates. They make up the almost 1300 member um, um, federal convention. Um, Joachim Gauck is the current um, president um, since 1212, uh, 2012. Uh, so, so there will be, the federal convention will be convening next year to be choosing the federal um, president. The chancellor um, elected by majority of the Bundestag, leader of the party with the majority of seats in the Bundestag, you know, the, the usual regular way. There are limits on power because um, of the chancellor because the Bundesrat uh, <coughs> must ratify all legislation that the Bundestag passes. The executive, the active wing of the executive, the chancellor and her cabinet may dominate the legislature. But that's not the end of, story, end of the story because whatever the legislature passes has to be passed, I mean, I'm sorry, whatever the lower house of the legislature passes has to be passed in the upper house. So whatever the Bundestag passes has to be passed by the Bundesrat. Please. We don't call that a veto, but it has legislative power. So, so uh, yes. So, so they can they can block legislation. Uh, veto is generally we 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 use the term veto for. Uh, the executive, or, um, that's why I, I, I hesitate to say veto, but, but blocking power. Angela Merkel had been uh, the chancellor for uh, more than 10 years. Um, sh we hear she's running again in 2017, and that the chances are that, that she will be leading the country for another four years. Okay? Um, so, so all legislation to be implemented uh, has to be passed by the Bundesrat too. Uh, bureaucracy and um, policy making, well, um, Germany has always been endowed with a powerful and meritocratic um, bureaucracy protected, insulated from, um, from political pressure, uh, highly proficient, very efficient, um, by German standards, and policy implementation, however, takes place at the land level. So federal uh, level bureaucracy um, designs, help design, help inform, but implementation takes place at the land level. Uh, I'll talk about this a bit later on. Uh, Semi-public institutions, we have strong state or central state or centralized state centralized, I'm sorry, state had been discredited um, 
in the 1940s when the, when the founding fathers were writing up, drafting the, um, the Grundgesetz. So, so federalism is very important. Um, the excesses of Nazism um, and, um, and because the Americans were involved in writing up the Constitution, drafting the Constitution, the importance of private sector as opposed to a centralized uh, state uh, had been important in the writing process of the, um, the Grundgesetz. Uh, this country, this political economy, is also run by democratic corporatism, as I have given examples, as I've tried to explain to you, which is rooted in medieval guilds. Remember, we talked about city-states um, in medieval times, um, craftsmen, tradesmen, um, guilds were important in economic organization. So negotiating, bargaining, consulting, cooperating were, um, were very important instruments dating back to medieval guilds. Uh, these are inclusionary systems of interest intermediation guilds have been. So um, it, in a way, democratic co corporatism combines representation, interest representation, um, policy making, but also implementation. Okay, so, so implementing policies, implementing whatever has been, um, has been decided is, um, is through this tripartite um, system of uh, bargaining, negotiation, cooperation, consultation, um, and all that. Um, and one, there are institutions of uh, workers' participation. Unions are very important, have historically been important, especially in post-World War II era in the Federal Republic. Um, Co-determination is, um, is an important institution here. Workers have a voice. They get voice opportunities um, in, in processes of collective bargaining. Um, they sit on boards of directors of large firms. So, so they co-determine certain policies. They co-determine the fate, the life, the future of institutions. This has been changing over time, but this has been an institutionalized way of interest intermediation, representation, and implementation, um, as was the case or has, has been the case in the past. And works councils, we, we talked about this, they represent workers inside the firm, they address shop floor grievances, um, firm level affairs, they also voice all kinds of interests at the firm level. So, so this is, as you can see, um, what, also, what also Leipart models as consensual style, consensual model of uh, governing, model of democracy, okay? as opposed to um, majoritarian models. As you can see, it's a networked society. Chambers of industry, chambers of commerce are very important. Uh, works councils are important, unions are important, business associations are important, both at the land level. In, in fact, even research is organized. Um, I am part of the Turkish delegation to Horizon 2020, which is the research institution of the European Union. Um, I tend to see that, yes, there is, uh, we, we make decisions with the federal research uh, institutions, but uh, there, are, there are research organizations or at different land level. Uh, I meet, for example, sometimes with the Bavarian um, Institute or institution uh, for research. So, so each and every land has their own institutionalized regimes of governance, which involve um, all kinds of networks. Um, so chambers of industry, chambers of commerce, unions, uh, parties, they're all organized at the land level too. This in a way attests to the networked character of German society. Um, 
so, so these semi-public institutions are, are important. With respect to military and the police, um, as you can imagine, um, Prussian history till 1945, uh, powerful, centralized, aggressive military. Uh, so the military had been uh, placed under tight control, very tight controls, um, in the Grundgesetz, uh, under tight legal as well as treaty control. So international treaties. Um, so, so defense only in Europe. So they can defend German lands in Europe, or they have to be working with NATO. So the German military cannot step outside of Germany unless treaties allow, okay? unless uh, international community allows it. Um, so, and, but, but there's also universal conscription. Um, that's also, but it may involve not only military, but also civilian duties. Um, the police is organized on the land level, at the land level, on a land basis. They're supposed to protect human and civil rights too. Uh, judiciary, we have an independent judiciary, which is an active administrator in the system, active administrative or of law rather than arbiter only. So, so it, courts are important. They define, interpret the meaning of law. So court decisions are important. For example, uh, Turkey, and Federal Republic of Germany, uh, because of the association agreement of 1960s between Turkey and then the European Economic Community, um, there had been visa issues. Uh, Turk Turkish citizens are are exposed to to. I mean that they are supposed to obtain a visa before entering into Germany. But even court decisions at the land level or at the city level may provide grounds for um, bringing a case against the, the German government. So, so courts are very important in Germany in not only implementing decisions, but also defining, understanding, interpreting legislation. That's also very important. Uh, we have three significant courts. The Federal High Court, which is the Court of Appeal, um, from lower courts, the system of lower courts, uh, criminal as, a, as well as civil codes, uh, civil courts, I'm sorry. So federal high court is one important um, court of appeal. The special constitutional court, um, which is relegated, I mean, what, jurisdiction of which, competences of which are relegated to matters related to basic law, Grundgesetz, and administrative courts such as the labor court, um, such as the social security court, such as the finance courts, this, that, and the other, which in a way provide checks on arbitrary powers of the bureaucracy. So this is, um, this is the court system. Once again, it's an independent system. Yes, I did mention that it looks like a fusion of powers, but by fusion of powers, I mean de facto um, executives domination of the legislature, but we do have a, a very strong and jealously guarded independent court system. Okay, so, so the judiciary is is another check on the system. Uh, federalism and subnational governance or government. Um, we have now 16 Länder, um, which has each of which has considerable autonomy. Each has their own Landtag, uh, their own regional um, assemblies, land level assemblies, land level parliaments. They have their own governments. Um, the elections generally do not coincide, elections at the land level generally do not coincide with elections at the federal level. Um, we have in Germany an interesting 
um, model of federalism, which is sometimes referred to as marble cake federalism. This is, some, this is in other times referred to as cooperative federalism. Anyone who's eaten a marble cake, huh? mosaic pasta. So as you can see, it's really mingled. The elements are really mingled. Um, the land lander, the land level, is the local level, the municipal, the city level. There, each of these subnational units have a say in the system, uh, not only in designing laws and legislations, but also in implementing uh, laws and legislations. Therefore, it's a system of mixing of powers. It's a system of mixing of resources. It's a system of mixing programs among different levels of governance, multiple levels of governance. So federal, uh, regional land, I mean, and local governments. And the lender are responsible for policy implementation that have been decided at the national, i.e. federal level. Um, it's a marble cake federalism as opposed to um, layer cake federalism. Marble cake is mixed and mingled and interwoven. Close cooperation is needed. That's why it's called cooperative federalism. Layer cake federalism is, co is another system, as we see in the US. Um, it's a dual, excuse me, dual tier system, or sometimes it's referred to as dual federalism. Um, there are tensions between the state and the federal level. Here we do not have tensions in that respect. There is um, the land level, the, the state level, and the federal level competences are clearly demarcated against one another. They're clearly um, marked. Um, and there is divided sovereignty here. Here we do not have divided sovereignty because sovereignty is so interwoven. It's like a marble cake in that respect. It's not a two layer, um, layered cake federalism. Um, in the divided sovereignty system or the dual federal system or the layer cake federalism system, um, state governments exercise powers without the interference of the federal level. So the federal level cannot be encroaching upon, bearing down upon the state levels. But here um, we have an interwoven, inter, um, intermingled system. Uh, policy making, it lies mainly with the, I mean, the responsibility of policy making lies mainly with the chancellor and the cabinet. So at the federal level, the executive is responsible for policy making, especially um, in times of single party governments. We have many coalitions in German history. I will, we'll talk about that next time. So especially in, uh, in, single party govern governments, we have the executive de facto controlling uh, the legislative agenda. So it, policy making is, su is with the um, chancellor and the cabinet. Corporatist um, or neo-corporatist, democratic corporatist, there is all kinds of consultation. It's largely consensus based. So policy making uh, and uh, processes and it's largely informal. So uh, as you can see, um, the idea of federalism, the idea of network society, the idea of cooperative uh, cooperation, um, consensus seeking had been marking post-World War II German history. And it has been very important. I learned from a German professor um, as I participated in a conference last week in Berlin uh, that Germany, there wasn't a culture of negotiation right in the immediate aftermath of World War II. Don't forget, this all happened, the war happened, because of gridlocks, stalemates, non-cooperative behavior. But Germany built, or Germans built, 
this culture of cooperation, consultation, um, and intermediation. That was also interesting to learn. I thought Germans, I was under the impression that Germans had always been prone to cooperation, consultation, uh, corporatist ways of consensus seeking. But apparently, it dawned on me that it wasn't like this before, right? Uh, what brought Hitler to power was fragmentation itself, um, but that this was actively cultivated by actors in the post-World War II period. So that was, um, that was what I learned very recently, and I wanted to share that with you. OK, I'll see you next class on Friday at um, 9.40. I'll see you. Bye.